You know, why do people have such a fit about God calling his creation, his creation, his man, not his whole creation, but his man, little gods? If he's God, what's he going to call them but the God kind? I mean, if you as a human being have a baby, you call it a human kind. If, if cattle has another cattle, they call it cattle kind. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created in his image? It's not how God sees you that determines where your life ends up. If it had been, Moses wouldn't have died in the wilderness. It's not how God sees me. It's how I think God sees me. What? That determines where I end up. I prove it to you all the way from Genesis chapter 1. Remember, let us make man in our image. God needed someone to show the world what he looked like, or else he would have just been a concept. God would have been an abstract theory. When God said, I am to Moses, you know, my name is I am, he was trying to get him to see you are as I am. That's what a mirror does. God says, I want to see myself in you. When God sees you, he sees himself. He sees his son. Christ is the image of the invisible God. And if he is in you, he is more than the world against you. So this God-like person inside of Ben here right here has nothing to do with flesh and blood. It's a part of God. He's a little God walking in a, in a little body, saying in Jesus' name, God came from heaven, became a man, made man into little gods, went back to heaven as a man. He faces the Father as a man. I face devils as the Son of God. Jesus said, go in my name, go in my stead. Don't say I have, say I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Say after me, within me. It's a God man. Say it again. Within me, it's a God man. Now let's say it even better than that. Let's say I am a God man. Love will take you way further than the law ever could. I'll prove it to you. Let's say your child is in a horrible accident. Let's say they bust their head wide open on the monkey bars. And they fall off the monkey bars and monkey bars are like... 30 feet high. I'm making this an extreme example. And they fall down and they bust their head wide open. And you scoop them up and put them in the car to get them to the emergency room. And on the way to the emergency room, every sign you see says, uh, speed limit. How much attention do you pay to the numbers beneath the speed limit in that moment? Those numbers mean nothing to you. Why? Because somebody that you love is in trouble. And in that moment, any parent will break the law for the sake of love. Any human parent will break the law for the sake of love. And what will really turn your heart to God is not when you hear his laws, which were given for our good, by the way, but they were powerless because there wasn't enough leverage in our action to keep the law. So what God did when he sent his son, and this is why we get excited in church, and this is why tears fill our eyes when we think about Jesus, and this is why the gospel is still good news in the world today, because God broke the law for love. I said to every sinner, God broke the law for love. I mean that he scooped you up in his arms. I mean that he's carrying you in his grace. I mean that what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his son in the likeness of a sinful man. I am a little God. Yes. Yes. I have his name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation. Yes. I am a little God. Critics, you are God. anything that he is. Yes. And everything produces after its own kind. If horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what?
If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. Friends have frank and open conversations with each other. I've done that with the Lord. I've had the Lord say, uh, Jesse, I've had God come tell me, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I've had the Lord literally say, what do you think about this? God has asked me for my opinion. God asks Jesse Duplantis for his opinion? Pray tell, continue. Let's not take him out of context. So. I said, well, Lord, since you ask, uh, maybe I'm doing it. He said, no, we can talk frankly. What do you think? I said, well, I don't think you ought to do that. He said, why you don't think I ought to do that? I said, well, you know, I, I know you know people more than I do, but you know, Lord, if you just let me, let me do a little bit more work on this individual, I think we can get them to you. He says, okay, go ahead. Do what you have to do. And I tell you what, the Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. And he who thinks he can counsel God is a fool. <laughs> who is this? Who is this that darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? Who does this man think he is? God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not um, subordinate to God even. And Adam is as much like God as you could get. Just the same as Jesus, when he came into the earth, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He wasn't a lot like God. He's God manifested in the flesh. And I want you to know something. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. You see what I'm talking about? He said, Ben Ann, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say I am, you're saying I'm a part of it, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. Kenneth Hagin states, quote, Man was created on terms of equality with God, and he could stand in God's presence without any consciousness of inferiority. God has made us as much like himself as possible. He made us the same class of being that he is himself." Unquote. Kenneth Hagin stated, quote, You are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. Every man who has been born again is an incarnation and Christianity is a miracle. The believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. Unquote. I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Here's where it's going to get big for some people. Get ready. Go, go ahead. Email me now in that place. <laughs> go ahead. You tap into who you really are. You know what the Bible calls you? It says you are a little Elohim. You are a little God. How many of your children are God? Oh, see, no, listen, listen. Nobody has problems saying, I'm a child of God. Everybody has problems saying, I'm a little G. Oh, everybody has problems saying, listen, let, let, let's get down to it. Everybody got problems saying, I'm a God. Yeah. See, look at you, just had a problem. <gasps> but I didn't say it. He said, You don't have a God in you. You are one. These people are not Christians. Oh. Justin, are you saying that they're not saved? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's it. You mark my word. No, they're not saved. You cannot be indwelt 
by God's Holy Spirit who leads us into truth, who sanctifies us in the truth, who illumines the meaning of God's Word to us, you cannot be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and teach these kinds of blasphemies, these kinds of heresies. The Holy Spirit would be screaming at them. Are the people in this movement, the lay people, are they Christians? Most are not, the vast majority of not. There will be a smattering of real believers, but hear me, hear me, dear ones. When God saves somebody, He changes them, and He leads them into truth. Can a genuine Christian be in serious theological error? Yes, for a season. Not indefinitely. Not indefinitely. If the Holy Spirit is strong enough to save you, He is also strong enough to move you out of a theological cult. I'm, I'm going to say something going to knock your lights off. God has the power to take life, but He can't. he got the power to do it, but He won't. He's bound. He can't. He says death and life is in the power of whose tongue? Yours. You ready for this? You want something to knock your lights off? You choose when you live. You choose when you die. Death and life's in the power of your tongue. Not God's. So, God has the power to take life, but He can't. I think that might come as a bit of a surprise to a number of people in the Bible. Remember uh, King Herod, when God killed him and he was eaten by worms? Remember Uzzah? He reached up to steady the ark and God struck him dead. You think God doesn't take obedience seriously? I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's the thing that gives Him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship Him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Because that's what makes God happy. Amen. Humanism is, I believe, the most deadly and disastrous of all the philosophical tensions that swept up through the grating over the pit of hell. And it has penetrated so much of our religion that it is in utter and total contrast with Christianity. I am afraid that it becomes so subtle that it goes everywhere. What is it? In essence, it's this. That this philosophical postulate that the end of all being is the happiness of man has been a sort of covered over with evangelical terms and biblical doctrine until God reigns in heaven for the happiness of man. Jesus Christ was incarnate for the happiness of man. All the angels exist in the whole. Everything is for the happiness of man. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. And I submit to you that this is unchristian. Christianity says the end of all being is the glory of God. Humanism says the end of all being is the happiness of man. And one was born in hell, the deification of man. And the other was born in heaven, the glorification of God. You didn't know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. Dear friends, there's only one reason one reason for a sinner to repent, and that's because Jesus Christ deserves the worship and the adoration and the love and the obedience of his heart. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. You're trying to serve God because he'll do you good. 
But a repentant heart is a heart that has seen something of the enormity of the crime of playing God and denying the just and righteous God the worship and obedience that he deserves. Why should a person come to the cross? Why should a person embrace death with Christ? Why should a person be willing to go in identification down to the cross and into the tomb and up again? I'll tell you why. Because it's the only way that God can get glory out of a human being. You say it's because you'll get joy or peace or blessing or success or fame, then it's nothing but a Levite serving for ten shekels in a church. We're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves. Because God takes pleasure when we're happy. And so the reason for you to go to the cross isn't that you're going to get victory. You will get victory. It isn't that you're going to have joy. You will have joy. But the reason for you to embrace the cross and press through until you know that you can testify with Paul, I'm crucified with Christ, isn't what you're going to get out of it, but what you'll get out of it. For the glory of God. Because that's what makes God happy. Amen.